Chapter 25, Capacitance. First box, why should I care about capacitors? And the first answer is because they're everywhere and they're really important. Capacitance is really important in neurotransmitters, specifically in the neuron cell. This is the Z machine at Sandia National Laboratory. It uses several large capacitors, seen here, to store a lot of electricity and then release it all at once, which creates super strong magnetic fields that are used for fusion research and other research applications. Capacitors are used in power transmission to regulate voltage levels. Capacitors are probably most common in filtering circuits. Sometimes they block high frequencies and let the low frequencies through. Other times they block the low frequencies and let the high frequencies through. This is important for a ton of different electronics applications. Supercapacitors are a new kind of capacitor that's gaining a lot of interest for storing vast amounts of electricity from solar power, wind power, and other forms of renewable energy. Historically, one of the challenges of renewable energy had to do with the inability to store electricity. You had to more or less use the energy as it was being produced. Now with supercapacitors, the hope is we can store electrical energy even when the sun isn't out or the wind isn't blowing. Capacitors come in many shapes and sizes and types, and they're made from a lot of different kinds of materials. These are all relatively small capacitors. Here you see some larger capacitors and again here's a bank of capacitors at a power transmission substation. Let's talk again about the electricity plumbing analogy. The amount of water that flows through a pipe is analogous to Q, the amount of charge that flows through a wire. From chapter 24 we said voltage is analogous to a difference in water pressure. A capacitor is analogous to something called an hydraulic accumulator. These devices provide clever ways of storing fluids and act as a reservoir. So if you have an overflow of fluid, these absorb the overflow. And if you need some fluid or have a shortage of fluid, these provide what you need. Box number one, definition. Two electrically isolated conductors form a capacitor. Look at the picture in box number two. Those are the two conducting plates that are separated. The two physical characteristics that we care about right now are the plate surface area A and the separation between the plates D. Something does the work to deposit deposit charges on a capacitor. So for example, the top plate might accumulate a charge of plus 6 coulombs, which means the bottom plate has to have a charge of negative 6 coulombs. In this case, we would say the capacitor has a charge of 6 coulombs, not 12, not 0, but 6. Box 2, this is why we like capacitors. The charges that accumulate in a capacitor form an electric field between the plates. Notice how uniform the electric field is between the plates. There are some edge effects, but for the most part, it's a very uniform predictable electric field between the plates which is a good thing because we can design it for very specific purposes with a lot of accuracy. Check out this capacitor that's being charged by the battery. The battery is doing work to move charges from the top plate to the bottom plate. Look at the graph of charge versus time. It's a logarithmic growth curve and starts off steep and strong because there's no mutual repulsion to get in the way but as this capacitor gets charged you can notice that things are slowing down. It's becoming increasingly difficult to take a negative charge from the top plate and move it to the already negatively charged bottom plate because of mutual repulsion. This is where you get the flatlining effect. At some point, the battery won't be able to do the work to move any more charges because there's just too much mutual repulsion getting in the way. Technically, this never really flatlines, but it does approach an asymptote. Okay, let's look at the same thing, a capacitor charging. The battery is doing work to move charges from the top plate to the bottom plate. Now we're looking at a graph of current versus time. Again, at first it's free and easy and wide open. The current flows at a good rate because there's no mutual repulsion to deal with. But as time progresses and the plate fills up, there is mutual repulsion that gets in the way and we start to decay. The current starts to really slow down and we get this classic exponential decay curve. So the charge buildup is growing logarithmically and the current decay is diminishing exponentially. Okay, now let's look at a capacitor that's fully charged. We take out the battery and the capacitor begins to discharge. All of these mutually repelling charges finally can go home and return the capacitor to a neutral state. Look at the charge versus time graph. At first, the charges flow really fast because the charges are very anxious to get away from all of their mutual repelling neighbors. So as time goes by, the capacitor's charge diminishes exponentially. Same thing, we're looking at a discharging capacitor, but now it's a graph of current versus time. 
In this case, the graph looks just like the discharging capacitor's charge levels at the very beginning, or also known as the transient response of the current, is very rapid because the charges are anxious to get away from their mutually repelling neighbors. But as time goes by, there's less mutual repulsion and things start to diminish. So the current is decaying in a discharging capacitor exponentially as well. This is a little bit different than what we talked about with a charging capacitor. Box number three, here's the Q equals CV equation. It relates capacitor charge, capacitance, and voltage. So we need to know what capacitance means. We should first note that a capacitor's capacitance does not depend on anything other than plate geometry. Later we'll update that statement, but for now only the plate size and the plate separation determine capacitance. Capacitance is a measure of how much charge must be deposited on the plates to produce a desired voltage between the plates. Another way to think of it is capacitance determines how easily a capacitor can store charge. The Khan Academy videos I assigned really go into this very nicely and will make things super clear if they're not clear already. We have a brand new unit. If we did dimensional analysis on the Q equals CV equation and isolated for C, we would see that capacitance is given by coulombs per volt, which we will call the farad after Michael Faraday. Okay, it's time to derive the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Go through boxes 1 through 10 really carefully. This is a great derivation because we dust off the expression for the electric field produced by a charged plate, which we actually derived twice, once in chapter 22 and once in chapter 23. Box 1, for a single charged plate, the electric field is given as sigma over 2 epsilon naught. A parallel plate capacitor has two plates. Here's the positively charged plate showing field lines uniformly flowing outward. Here's the negatively charged plate showing the field lines uniformly flowing inward. And here's what you get when you put them next to each other. The field lines to the left of the positive plate and to the right of the negative plate cancel out. The field lines between the plates double. In practice, you do have some edge effects and the canceling isn't perfect, which is where shielding comes into play. Box number three is reminding us that the electric field can be determined by the gradient of the voltage. Box number nine is our capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Once again, it's only determined by the plate area and the distance between the plates and also the permittivity of free space epsilon naught. You've seen epsilon naught before. I think that was introduced first in chapter 21, permittivity of free space. And in box 10, we're going to do some dimension manipulation so that we can now express permittivity of free space in terms of farads per meter. Next section, energy stored in a capacitor. This is a great visual showing what happens to store energy in a capacitor. Read through each and every one of these description bullets multiple times because one of the primary benefits of capacitors is its energy storage capability. Box 1. Start by taking a single charge on that right side plate and moving it across the gap and depositing positing it on that left side plate. In this case, you're doing positive work and you are the external force doing external work and the system's electrostatic potential energy is increasing. Make sure that makes sense to you. In box two, we remember the definition of voltage. We combine boxes one and two to get box three. In box number four, we recycle the capacitor equation, which is Q equals CV, to come up with an updated expression for the external work. So now that we know the amount of external work needed to move a single charge from one plate to another, it's time to integrate. I start off with no charges transferred and I end up with a total amount of Q, capital letter Q, Q, charges transferred from one plate to the other. Box six, solve and evaluate this integral. In box seven, we remember box number one, which said that the work done by an external force is equal to the change in the electrostatic potential energy of the field existing between those two plates. So the electrostatic potential energy possessed by this field equals Q squared over 2C. If I combine the capacitor equation, which is Q equals CV, I can get two equivalent expressions. So altogether in box seven, you see a total of three different expressions to calculate the electrostatic potential energy possessed by a parallel plate capacitor. Remember why we like capacitors. 
They're useful in timing circuits, filtering and regulation applications, including neuron cells, and also they're useful energy storage devices, which begs the question, what's the difference between a battery and a capacitor? A battery stores energy via electrochemical processes. A capacitor stores energy in its electrostatic field. One thing a capacitor can do far better than a battery is very quickly release all of its energy. The internal resistance of a capacitor is typically far less than it is for a battery, which is the key reason why you can flush all of the energy from a capacitor very quickly like you see here in this lightning storm of discharge. Next section, dielectrics. All real capacitors have dielectrics. Dielectrics alter the properties of a capacitor in profoundly important ways. Once again, the Khan Academy videos I specified really do a great job describing how capacitors work in general and how dielectrics work in particular. Okay, here's our parallel plate capacitor. On the left shows the capacitor with nothing in between. It's just a vacuum. This capacitor is charged and that attached meter is showing a voltage value. On the right is the same system, but this time there's a dielectric inserted between these two plates. A dielectric is a material that's very dipolar. This is one reason why we spent so much time studying dipoles. Notice that the charge is unchanged, but the voltage is lower. In some circumstances, this is very desirable. Box one. That variable in the denominator is Greek letter kappa. Kappa is always greater than one. So whenever you put a dielectric between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor, the voltage will diminish and the charge will remain unchanged. That's the goal. Kappa is the dielectric constant and it is a material property and it is, again, heavily dependent on dipole properties. Box two shows you the updated expression for the capacitance of a capacitor with a dielectric. Box three shows you the updated expression to determine the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor in terms of its dielectric constant kappa, its plate area, A, and the gap between the plates, D. Box four is showing you what's going on in terms of the dipole particles within the dielectric itself. Capacitance increases because you can now store the same amount of charge at a lower voltage. This is one side of the coin. The other side is when the capacitor remains attached to a voltage source. In that situation, the dielectric allows more charge to accumulate at the same voltage. Once again, the Khan Academy video does a great job explaining this in even more detail. Box five dielectric benefits. A dielectric allows the capacitor to store a given amount of charge at a lower voltage, which is sometimes a benefit, or a dielectric allows the capacitor to store more charge at a given voltage, which sometimes that's the goal. A dielectric also provides a physical barrier. This allows the capacitor to have a really small gap. The smaller the gap, the greater the capacitance, which enhances the first two bullets in box five, and it also helps prevent breakdown, which is when charge literally jumps from one plate to the other. Let's look at some dielectric constants. A vacuum has a dielectric constant, also known as kappa, of one because there are no dipolar properties in a vacuum. Neoprene has a dielectric constant of 6.7, which means it significantly enhances the capacitance of a capacitor. Strontium titanate has a dielectric constant of 310. Strontium titanate is one of the best dielectrics out there. Water itself is a good dielectric constant, and that should come as no surprise since we know by now that water molecules are dipoles. Lastly, there are two types of capacitors, polar and nonpolar capacitors. Polar capacitors have a permanent dipole moment, which means you have to be aware of the positive terminal and the negative terminal of a capacitor. Next section, capacitors in series. The picture on the left shows two capacitors connected in series. The symbol, which we refer to as a schematic symbol, shows a capacitor as two parallel lines to represent the parallel plates. If I connect two or or more capacitors in series, they blend together to provide an aggregate capacitance. Let's talk about the acronym SERI-Q, which means capacitors in series carry the same charge. Here you're looking at three different capacitors connected in series. 
Notice that they all have different capacitance values and they all have different voltage drops. The voltage drop across capacitor C1 is 0.818 volts. The voltage drop across capacitor C2 is 0.409 volts. And the voltage drop across capacitor C3 is 0.273 volts. If you add up all three of those voltage drops, it should equal 1.5 volts. 1.5 volts is being invested in this loop and some of it gets spent on each of the three capacitors until there's none left over at the bottom of capacitor C3. Let's use some basic numbers for simplicity and think about it like this. That battery pumps nine positive charges onto the top plate of capacitor C1. Those nine positive charges attract nine negative charges onto the bottom plate of capacitor C1. Those negative nine charges in turn attract nine positive charges to the top plate of capacitor C2, which in turn attract nine negative charges to the bottom plate of capacitor C2. And finally, those negative nine charges attract nine positive charges to the top plate of capacitor C3, which attract nine negative charges to the bottom plate of C3. So in every case, for each capacitor, the charge is the same. They each have a charge of nine. Again, keeping numbers simple. The actual number is something different, but whatever that number is, it's the same for each of these capacitors in series. And I could have any number, I could have a thousand capacitors in series and they would all have the same charge, even though they have different capacitor values and even though they have different voltage drops. Notice that if I change the voltage values across each capacitor by changing this battery voltage, the amount of charge on each capacitor changes, but they all remain equal to each other. This is Seri Q. So let's pretend we put a sensor at point A. Say we hire Probert, our positive unit test charge, to stand at various points and report voltage values back to us. Probert starts at point A, records a certain value, V subscript A, crosses the first capacitor and experiences the change in voltage associated with that capacitor, crosses that second capacitor, C2, and similarly records that change in voltage and ends up at point B. So the voltage at A plus the change in voltage due to capacitor 1 plus the change in voltage due to capacitor 2 is equivalent to the voltage at point B. In this box titled, what is the voltage at B minus the voltage at A? We simply do a basic arithmetic rearrangement of this formula. And here in this expression, we use the capacitor equation, the Q equals CV equation, and make substitutions. The voltage at B minus the voltage at A is the change in voltage, or you could say the equivalent voltage. Here it is. Here's the capacitor equation that you use to determine the equivalent capacitance for some number of capacitors in series. Last section, capacitors in parallel. These two capacitors are connected in parallel, which means the voltage across them is the same. They may have different capacitor values and carry a different amount of charge, but the voltage across both of them is the same. This is true for two capacitors or any number of capacitors connected in parallel. Let's talk about the acronym PAR-V. Here you see three different capacitors, each having a different capacitance, but now you immediately notice they each carry a different amount of charge. The voltage drop across capacitor C1 is 1.5 volts. The voltage drop across capacitor C2 is also 1.5 volts. And the voltage drop across capacitor C3 is also 1.5 volts. Think of it like this. The top plates of each of those capacitors are all connected and they are each connected collectively to the positive terminal of that battery. The same is true for their bottom plates. They're all connected to each other and collectively to the negative terminal of that battery. Whatever the voltage value is of this battery, that's going to be the voltage drop across each of these three capacitors. I've decreased my battery voltage. Let's check out the voltage drop. My new battery voltage is 0.671 volts. My new voltage drop across capacitor C1 is also 0.671 volts. And it's the same for capacitor C2 and capacitor C3. 
This is par V. Devices connected in parallel carry the same voltage. If I wanted to figure out the amount of charge on each of these capacitors, I would just use the Q equals CV equation. Watch as I change the battery voltage like I'm doing right now. The voltage across each capacitor changes, but they all remain equal to each other. The capacitance remains unchanged, but the amount of charge on each capacitor not only changes, but they are not necessarily equivalent. In fact, with these values, they definitely aren't equivalent. This is par V. Here we say the total charge equals the charge stored in capacitor 1 plus the charge stored in capacitor 2. We again make use of the Q equals CV equation. Here we substitute an equivalent voltage because again, any devices connected in parallel carry the same voltage. And this is the expression used to find the equivalent capacitance for capacitors connected in parallel.